and I'm back. If you are watching this video, you should probably watch the previous video, uh, which I will link to in the description because that will provide the necessary background to understand what I am talking about in this video because I'll be interpreting quantum phenomena that I discuss in the previous video. So, without further ado, I will continue with my script. It has, as far as I am concerned, been proven by the Bell test that quantum objects do not have definite properties until measurement, and yet they are subject to extra spatiotemporal coordination, which determine what those properties will be under certain circumstances. Bohr, I believe, understood that the facts did not and would not bear out the scientific assumptions of his time, and that a paradigm shift was required to grapple with quantum phenomena, and he has been borne out pun not intended, he's been borne out by the Bell test, which was done after his death. On the other hand, Einstein did understand that the facts, as given, are unsatisfying in a non-trivial way. We are led to accept, without room for meaningful questions, that quantum objects are probability blobs that turn into particles under certain circumstances. What are these blobs? Why do they become particles? What is the mechanism? How does it work? Why is it random? Etc. Etc. Granted, it's um, kind of a yearning for a deeper explanation, and it's the easiest thing in the world to say, well, there is no explanation, that's just how it is, but that isn't... you can argue it's empirically, it's, it's empirically valid to do that. Valid maybe isn't the right word here, but it's not satisfying, and I don't think that is a feeling that should just be ignored for the sake of convenience. I think that the whole point of science is to try to understand things in a way that you get that, that click. Um, and that is not being allowed by the interpretation of quantum mechanics as essentially a non-interpretation of saying this is just the way things are, that, that it just doesn't work. So I'm very sympathetic. I've become very sympathetic to Einstein's plight. So... My approach is as follows. I'm just going to jump into it. Quantum objects, I think, this is my hypothesis, my theory, uh, quantum objects are not literally probability blobs. They're metaphorically that, in, as far as we're concerned in testing them, but literally, ontologically, they are always particles. Yet, in their behavior, they are effectively probability blobs, because they are self-moving. They themselves are the hidden variable determining their behavior. Quantum particles, in other words, have free agency, free will, basically, and they're able to self-direct their movements within certain material parameters. These parameters are either, I shouldn't say material parameters is because of what I'm about to say, these parameters are either external, forces acting upon them, which everybody is used to, we're cool with that, but I think there are also internal parameters, which are, those are the parameters that Einstein wants to find, but that we can't find with science as we have it at the time, or right now, as far as I know. These internal parameters are what I call, and what I called in my last video, non-local pilot waves, and they function analogously to Jungian archetypes which guide the particle's behavior instinctually, if you will. Pardon me. The archetypes are non-local because, in my theory, they access a plane outside of space-time which operates as a kind of collective unconscious and which coordinates quantum activity as a grand whole, just as the internet in my example with Bohr's, Bohr's version of the experiment, just as the internet coordinated the random number generator in Bohr's picture of the Bell test. There's an underlying structure which is outside of space-time, whatever that means, I don't have a good answer for that, but whatever that means, that is determining things and coordinating things irrespective of the normal relations and force relations that happen on the plane of space-time. There's an underlying unity, there's an underlying harmony going on. That's my notion. 
The reason that we cannot predict with certainty what a quantum object's properties will be is not because it doesn't have properties before measurement, but because its properties are not subject to external influences alone. It's because the, pro it's because the particles can swerve and spin as they like, and there is no scientific way to predict what any given quantum particle will like to do at a given moment. In other words, we can't predict a quantum object's properties because, not because it doesn't have properties, but because its properties are subject to change at the discretion of the quantum particle itself, which we can't really test that because it's not an external thing. Um, so there's no scientific way to predict what any given quantum particle will like to do at a given moment. All we can predict are the parameters which limit the expression of the particle's fancy, i.e. the external forces acting upon it, or the, the, well, rather, the external forces combined with the internal forces which guide it. And those internal forces we represent with, say, the Schrodinger equation. It's not likely to show up outside of a certain field. But specifically within that field, it's impossible to know because that is purely within the agency of the particle and who knows what and why it's doing what it wants. It's arbitrary in that sense. You don't, you know, you could argue that it's, it's, it's misleading to refer to it as free will. It really all I'm, I'm asking for is self-motivation to reinstate a notion of self-movement into physics. I'm going to break from my, from my script for a moment. Essentially, what I'm trying to do here is say that you cannot explain everything in terms of just entropy and inertia. There has to be, um, or at the very least, what we are seeing, I would argue, is evidence for self-movement in almost the Aristotelian sense. That nature has its own internal energy which is driving it in a certain direction, um, or is driving it, period. And it's not just this initial explosion of energy that is now sort of just working itself out, that there are elements uh, within the particles themselves which are moving them, which are allowing them to self-move. Essentially, I'm, I'm arguing for the notion of internal self-movement, that it is not all just external, which in a lot of ways this is me kind of arguing against some of the... the I wouldn't argue the spirit of the of what Galileo and some of the others were doing, but but some of the assumptions that were made there that were breaking away from Aristotle and were extremely fruitful, I think there is maybe evidence to say that some of those original Aristotelian assumptions need to be reinstated in order to explain what the quantum particles are doing. And the, the thing that I would like to reinstate would be this notion of self-movement. I have a lot of other ideas about that that aren't fully formed, um, but um, that's, that's where I'll leave it for now. So, final paragraph. The reason that photons form an interference pattern is because each photon has access to the same collective unconscious, the same internet program, if you prefer, which guides them to act in concert with a model none of the individual photons can comprehend on its own, but which we humans can see, standing sort of from our vantage point, that what they're doing is, as an aggregate, they are behaving as a wave. In Jungian terms, the photon archetype, if you will, the photon's archetype of the self, which guides its behavior towards the future, that archetype is meant to approximate the motion of a wave. It feels guided to, to move within certain parameters. It does its best, as it were, and that's where the randomness comes in, because you can't account for, for everything when you're dealing with free will, and so it hits more or less where it needs to. And you won't see the wave pattern unless you have enough particles, because that way you can, you can account for the fact that, who knows, maybe some particles will just completely fly off into space which we don't know, that because they're random. That's possible with the whole Geiger counter situation. But if you get enough of them, the probability will assert itself, that you're not going to get them all doing that if they all have these internal forces moving them to try to approximate the wave function. And if you get like a couple billion of them, then it may just as well be an infinite continuous wave.
just made out of so many particles. It's just a matter of resolution, basically. So uh, they're behaving as a wave. Um, in Jungian terms, the photon's archetype of the self, it is, it is arguable that human beings in the same way feel pressed and guided by internal forces or instincts or archetypes to fulfill roles in a mass sociological drama. Free will is the factor which allows individuals to choose which roles to play and how to play them or potentially to not play any roles at all, but that the roles must be played in the aggregate is merely an expression of the laws of probability, given enough individuals run the gambit for the overall pattern to appear. And that is the end of my script, so that is the end of my video. Those are my thoughts, that's where my, my thinking has been going in trying to understand non-locality and potential um, implications from it. I think it's extremely interesting, I may very well make my thesis about it, um, but you know, I'd be curious what, what you guys uh, have to say, um, and I will see you in the next video.